gentlemen everyone thank you for coming it's good to see you uh, very very excited for another week of the game engine architecture course um, and uh, I just had to I was super excited last night I can't remember exactly what time it came in uh, it was a very late night for me uh, we officially have our first homework two finished and it uh, I, I I haven't even introduced the assignment yet uh, and so uh, uh, wait uh, uh, Nicholas are you here are you here on the live stream. Okay, impressive, impressive. Okay, so I had this idea when that came through so quickly that maybe like, oh, maybe we could like reward the first person to finish an autograded assignment in the autograder. That would be super fun, I think. But we're going to be starting our autograded assignments in a week or so. Uh, and so actually, no, about five days. Uh, and so um, I'm super, super excited to see how that goes. I really think you're going to like it. Getting into the nitty gritty C++, SDL, well, not SDL yet, but I think you're going to like it. We'll see. All right, uh, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get into it. I have something I want to show you, all right? Uh, and it's on my uh, my folder right here. It's this little game, it's a little, it's a little game engine. It's called Mugen. Has anyone heard of Mugen? Okay. Mugen has something of a, a kind of a cult following. It's not a game engine you see out there every day, but it's a game engine that lots of people have heard of. It looks something like this. If you've ever seen footage of some very much copyrighted characters just brawling as if they were in a 2D fighting game, you might ask, well, what kind of Smash Bros. style game is that? Well, it's not a Smash style game. It's actually a game engine. It's a fighting game engine, a 2D one. Um, and its entire thing is making it pretty easy to create new characters uh, and bring them in to this kind of extensible, customizable engine. Mugen translates to infinite, and this is very much an appropriate name. Uh, you can bring in characters of all sorts. You can customize them. You can add story content. You can customize stages, music, mechanics. It is really impressive stuff. It was released initially in 1999 by a mysterious company called Electbyte. Um, so Electbyte... Uh, was something of an internet mystery until a couple months ago uh, because like people didn't really know who they were. They also kind of stopped supporting Mugen, and so people were really wanting updates to the engine. It's not open source, and they just couldn't figure out who Electbyte was And you know, because they wanted to ask him, are you going to keep the engine going? Are you going to – can you give us a license to work on the engine, right? Um, and so they were very, very mysterious. Um, well, a couple months ago, I saw a hint – Apparently, the community got a cease and desist letter a couple of years ago from Electbyte. They're still around. They, they're still alive. They're not doing anything particularly interesting or useful, but they're sending cease and desist letters. Um, and they noticed that the return address was Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay. All right. Well, um, let's take a shot 
I wonder if their company is in the LoRa entity database in Michigan. And it was, right? So I found a few names, uh, people who started the company, and I plugged them into the M community little, um, little uh, database, and they were right there. So we were able to confirm that Mugen was created by University of Michigan undergraduate students, and it became one of the most famous fighting game engines in the world. Okay, and they never claimed credit for any of it. Absolutely incredible, right? Absolutely incredible. You can read about the uh, article and about the engine and learn more about it here. You got Ronald McDonald versus uh, Goku. Um, you've got Pac Man uh, versus Sonic. Um, this was Smash before Super Smash Brothers was really a thing. Okay, I want to show you briefly how to use this engine um, really quickly. If you want to mess around with it, it is free to use. Uh, but it is still proprietary. The website looks like one from 1999. Um, and uh, so let's go ahead and see if we can use it here. So I've got my folder here. I've got this little engine thing here. I've also got lecture notes really quickly to remind me of the link I want to do here. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the, uh, the game, Mugen. And here's what it looks like. Okay. It's pretty simple. I can get in here. Well, you look at that. I got two characters. I got Kung Fu Man and uh, Kung Fu Man. Uh, and uh, I hope the stream is going okay. I, I remembered this time. Um, and uh, so I'm going to go with Kung Fu Man. Um, let's go. Okay. We got some intro story, and this can be customized. Okay. Um, there was an evil uh, demon person. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, I skipped it accidentally. Sorry. Um. Round one. one. Fight. 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 Okay. Uh oh. Okay, I'm, I'm not great at this. This is what I usually do in fighting games. Get him in the corner and just grab spam. Okay? Okay, I'm a... Uh, the, the ground, the like ground, the floor looks really good. Anyway, I'm not gonna play too much more of this. Um, I'm bummed because... Uh, my character selection is somewhat wanting here. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my little characters folder. We can see KFM Kung Fu Man and Kung Fu Man 720, which is like the high def, high res version. And I'm just like, I'm wanting uh, something a little bit more. <clears throat> and so um, let me see here. I'm going to go on to a CD uh, file sharing website. Uh, and uh, I'm going to grab... Yeah, uh, this, and I'm going to, let me see if I can extract all of that. Uh, let me see here. Okay, I'm going to uh, grab that. I'm going to go in. I'm going to place that folder right next to KFM. When we look into the character folders, we see def files. We see AI files, SFF files. These are all kind of custom bespoke file formats. They're not really standard, uh, and they're very specific to uh, Mugen and how it wants you to organize things. Shrek has kind of the same stuff in here. Um, but now what I need to do, if I run the engine right now, it's not going to work. I can go into data. I can go into the select.def uh, little thing here. And, uh, oh, oh, goodness. It's opening up all of Visual Studio. Okay. Um, and uh, what it's going to do, this is basically powering the character select, I think. And we need to find... Where is KFM? Is KFM in here? Oh, okay. Maybe I opened up the wrong one. Let me see in my notes real quick. Oh, select.def. Oh, I, I got system.def. Sorry. Let's open this in Notepad++. Okay. Um, and, ah, there it is. Oh, I already put it in there. So you can, okay, there you go. So I put this in here. Shrek, it's going to look in the Shrek folder. And Shrek's default stage is going to be this stage right here. Stages slash kfm.def. Um, and so when I run this now, when I run this, uh, let's see here, hopefully we'll have a new contender. By the way, I can change the difficulty and I can change. I want to see Shrek's victory screen. Uh, yeah. How many rounds? Can I change the rounds? No? What? Okay, anyway, you can customize some stuff here. It's pretty neat. Let's go into uh, Arcade. 
All right. Okay, I didn't I didn't know what he was gonna say there. Um, <laughs> all right, um, so um, yeah, I think that uh, Shrek those Shrek sprites were actually from a Game Boy Advance game. Um, and so anyway, there are so many different characters you can get out there. Adding them isn't that difficult, um, and it's a lot of fun. There are a lot of different characters. Um, the file formats here are pretty hideous. Um, they're pretty awful. Uh, let's go really quickly to Shrek.def and just look at it real quick. Um, yeah, it's just a weird file format. Um, you have to kind of know what the possible properties are. You can't really provide a one that doesn't uh, isn't recognized by Mugen. And it's hard to find documentation to know what properties uh, are even available. So it's kind of hard to learn, not super fun to edit, but it is Mugen. Uh, and it is, uh, it is there. It has made an impact, uh, and we're all very grateful for it. Um, uh, one final thing that I want to point out, if I can here... Um, let me, see, let me see. Can I find? Uh, can I find it? Let's go into Mugen real quick once more, and then we'll move on. Um, into Mugen, and you're gonna see it if you look really closely. Okay, look really closely in here, and it, and you're gonna it's gonna hit you. So Mugen is using SDL, which is uh, under the hood, which is the same kind of rendering and class uh, cross platform input library that we're gonna be using very soon. Uh, for your own engines, which is to say that in a small way, you're kind of following in the footsteps of those fantastic 1999 students uh, who created this uh, in your shoes, right? And so anyway, um, yeah, that is our game engine of the day. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give you one of these pretty much every lecture. Uh, and uh, yeah, you'll discover that the variety and history of game engines out there in the world is extremely diverse, very interesting, very weird, uh, and I hope you enjoy it, okay? All right, so <clears throat> let's uh, go ahead and, uh, and keep going here. Uh, I've got some announcements for you. Uh, first, um, I want to know, how did, how did homework one go? Good? Okay. What does good mean? Uh, it was fun. It was fun? Okay, that's good to hear. Okay. Yes? Pico 8 is weird. <laughs> it is indeed. All right, I marked it as that. Um, it's, uh, I think a lot of people, what's really interesting is um, a lot of people are very much drawn to minimalistic engines, right? Engines that put tight constraints on you. I know, did you know that, um, I think the initial version of Celeste was made in Pico 8. It was prototyped there. And in the, the final Celeste game, you can actually find a Pico 8 emulator uh, in the hotel in a hidden room, and you can play that original version of Celeste. Um, something about putting limitations on an artist, right? Focuses their attention on what they really want to focus on, on the gameplay, uh, and it worked well, very well for that team. Very well for that team. I'm a little bit nervous about these two first assignments because a part of me says, well, oh, you're making the same game in three engines? That's a bit tedious, isn't it? But another part of me thinks it's probably a good exercise. And at the very least, does it, do the three engines feel pretty different? Like they're, they're three pretty different kinds and categories of engines, but still they have some similarities in how they want you to do things. Well, I was just going to say it's really good exposure because it's someone that doesn't have that much experience with the engines. And it's yeah. like a nose dive I think uh, I think that's definitely a big thing. Um, if you haven't done much with game engines, um, the good news is that we don't ask you to do very much. Just get something moving, a script or two. That's it. Um, it's going to be more on homework too, by the way. Um, but um, yeah, we got to be careful not to overload anyone who's new to game engines. Got to keep that in mind. All right, very good. I noticed a few things when I was looking through the awesome projects. Um, everyone was kind of slipping in unique little features. I really like this one, Milo. Um, so this one is really interesting. It's not uh, so much a side-scrolling shoot 'em up It has wrapping around the sides here, um, and it also has more of a top-down feel to it, which is really uh, pretty interesting. Eight-directional aesthetic. Um, this one is pretty cool. Um, David Georgie, right? So when you move around, you actually point in those eight different directions, 
right? So that really feels like more of a top-down instead of a side-scrolling one, which is pretty interesting. Uh, we have pretty much basically an Atari 2600 game. We had a couple Pico 8s that were really great. Um, this is one of them. Look at that. Right? This, this is... That's Atari 2600 stuff right there. That's uh, that's E.T. Or maybe not E.T. Way better than E.T. Um, shooting features. Someone put shooting features. Uh, Jasmine um, put shooting features into their homework one. I think Jasmine also drew all of this too. Are you here, Jasmine? Yes, fantastic, fantastic job. No surprise, uh, amazing work. We had scrolling backgrounds, all right? Um, by the way, these are features you won't need until this week, so you were ahead of the game. Uh, Jacob did a fantastic job with this. Looks great. Um, there's one student I found who used Click Team Fusion, okay, uh, which is, um, which is uh, amazing in itself. Justin, are you here? Justin? I would ask uh, Justin if the engine was as crusty for him as it felt for me. I cannot believe FNAF was made in that engine. Um, and parallax scrolling, which is always a very impressive effect. I'm a big fan. Right? So parallax, the buildings going by at different speeds, uh, gives you this sense of depth that makes the world feel alive and deep. Uh, good job, Uni. Um, all right. Okay, so a few uh, more announcements, then we'll get into it for real. Uh, Nikhil's game engine repo just hit 200. I think he's closing in on 250 commits, and he's and he's just started homework seven. So, how many of you have like your own Git repo that you've put a few months into contiguously, and you've got like at least 300 commits? Like a few of you? Okay, not nearly enough of you. So we're gonna fix that. Okay, I guarantee it. We're going to fix that soon, okay? Homework 2 has launched. <clears throat> um, it is a pretty straightforward continuation of Homework 1. So the first homework was really just about getting started with the basic shmup, but really it wasn't much of a, a shmup or a cute em up You could move some things, right? Got some player controls going on. Got some aesthetics going on. When you're finished, it's going to look more like this. When you look at this, it's still very basic shmup, right? But you do have health slash lives. You've got um, projectiles, right? Um, and uh, you've got collision detection going in as well, right? You're also going to have uh, victory and defeat screens as well. Um, and um, this is when I think it's going to start to look uh, a little bit more fun. It's going to start to feel more like a game. Uh, and I think I, I hope you enjoy it. I really enjoyed looking through all your themes. Uh, and I can't wait to see how you all spice them up. All right? And I'm super excited. Um, anyway, this is very similar to the first assignment. You got another report you're going to do, and a few more written response questions to answer at the end. Um, you've got uh, more tips, tips for each one of these requirements, um, and um, more default assets and stuff like that. Oh, you're also going to have a lot of sound effects too. Um, if you are just uh, going to town and you want to make things even uh, cooler, uh, so you can post it to the exhibition channel uh, and flex a little bit. Lots of ideas for you now if you want to um, to add additional things to that shmup, okay? You certainly do not have to. All right. Um, any, uh, any questions? No? Okay. If you're getting bored of this approach, please know the real meat of the course, right? The real focus of the course begins on Monday, okay? When you will be getting low level, you'll be getting into the, the nitty-gritty, the trenches, uh, you'll be, uh, with your C++, you'll be learning Visual Studio, Xcode, and Make, if you don't know them. And you'll be getting a basic text adventure game up and running. From there, we will generalize it the following week. From there, we will add uh, support for visuals, 2D visuals, aesthetics. From there, we'll add Lua scripting support. The complexity of your task is going to go up uh, steadily from here on out, Okay. And next week, Monday, we start on your first auto grader assignment, which I'm extremely excited about. I think you'll enjoy it. Again, we'll talk more about the auto grader, but this auto grader, I think, is going to be friendlier than a, a lot. It'll give you more. It'll try and keep you moving fast. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay? Hopefully, it doesn't crash too much. All right. <clears throat> um, let's see here. What else do we got? 
Next lecture, you have your first quiz, okay? These quizzes are bi-weekly. Uh, these are very much a requirement for an upper-level CS. It was either these quizzes, or I have to give you a final exam. So I, I think, uh, yeah, I think I made the right choice, okay? Um, and if you look at the schedule, actually, you can see when these quizzes are going to happen ahead of time. So on Monday, right, and it's going to happen from 4.40 to 5 p.m. Essentially, I'm going to turn on the Canvas quiz. I'm going to flip it to on, uh, and you will be able to hopefully log into Canvas on your phone. I think there's a Canvas mobile app or on, ideally, a laptop that you bring. Bring enough charge for 20 minutes, okay? Or you can use these machines here. And you're going to have 20 questions. They're not particularly complex, uh, and uh, they're not going to be too wild, okay? These are not super difficult quizzes. They're mainly asking and verifying that you've been to lecture, that you've paid attention somewhat to lecture, uh, and that you've also done things like you've read through the syllabus, okay? And you should be pretty fine. Um, uh, let me see here. You should be able to take this quiz any from anywhere, anytime, okay? So you should be able to also take it uh, at home if you're not here, but you do need to take it in that window. If for some reason you absolutely can't grab 20 minutes uh, to do a quick quiz, uh, then um, please let me know. Maybe we can figure something out, um, and we're going to see how that goes. If you're curious about the quiz topics, uh, they're right here. It's going to be mainly syllabus policies, course policies, uh, and some basics uh, on game engines we're going to talk about today. So quickly skim back through the lectures, not nothing too long. Skim back through the discussion, uh, and you'll be fine. Uh, future um, quizzes will also include some stuff from homework as well. Not so much on this one, since you're all doing uh, different engines. Uh, it wouldn't really be fair to, to ask questions about each engine. Okay? All right. Uh, any questions? Okay. Oh, yes. Open note? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so I can't, uh, I'm not going to be policing your usage of notes. There's no way for me to do that, possibly. So yes, it's open note. Um, and remember, the worst quiz will be, will be dropped. If you do a really good job on the first four quizzes, you get to skip the fifth. That sounds pretty good. Okay. See if you can ma manage that. Uh, and uh, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, I want to talk about some course logistics. So this is the kind of thing that I never do on the first lecture. You know why? Now, you probably heard this before. Um, you think about the last film that you saw. Think about the last book that you read. Right? How does a film always begin? I think you'll struggle to find a film that doesn't begin this way. Let me ask you this. The last film you saw, did it begin with a calm, relaxed sit-down between the main characters in which they spent 10 minutes discussing the stakes of the universe, the setup of the world, the mechanics of the story? No, that comes like a bit into the movie, like 10, 15 minutes into the movie, that always happens. Films always begin with an exciting action set piece or some drama, right? Or some really high stakes, intense moment or some mystery, right? And the reason you do that is to try and hook people. It's kind of an entertainment thing, but really it's an engagement thing. And if it's about engaging, then lectures can also benefit from it. So in general, I don't like to talk about boring syllabus stuff on the first day because uh, I'm trying to hook you on that first day. Um, and so now that I've got you hooked, hopefully, uh, and you're in the course, uh, it's time to deliver some logistics so we don't end up like this. It's a pretty amazing clip. Uh, SpongeBob fans? Anyone? All right, very good. Doesn't get old. Okay, um, oops. All right, so um, let's talk about lectures really quickly. Um, so, my, oh, it's off. <clears throat> so lectures, right? It's gonna be 4.30 to 6 p.m. Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, we're gonna uh, cover topics like history, theory, discussion, stories. We're also gonna have certain lectures that are very workshop heavy. Uh, coming up, we're gonna have a lecture in which we basically build a little miniature game together in Visual Studio. I show you how to set things up. I talk you through why 
We structure things in a certain way, why we build out our code base and coding style in a certain way. We're going to have some lectures where we build data structures together, where we analyze little parts of our code base. Um, and, uh, and so we'll have uh, lectures on theory, lectures on workshops, and stuff like that. Hopefully it won't be too boring. We're very likely to have guest lectures. Uh, in, in particular, when a course is really new, I tend to rely on, on guest lectures a bit more because it's a really good lecture uh, that I don't always have the lecture material for. Bringing in someone in to talk about their industry experience is really great um, and also just helps the course logistically. Um, in particular, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to get Stardock uh, this uh, semester. They have a really interesting couple engines they use. And then they actually also use a standard off-the-shelf engine, which I'll talk about in just a bit. Um, we'll also have discussions, right, every Friday. Uh, and this will be led by our fantastic team. Uh, this will be uh, very much in the nitty-gritty, right, uh, in the details related to homeworks. How can we get you going in homeworks uh, and stuff like that, okay? Uh, so you'll want to show up to those. Uh, but if you don't, uh, know that all this stuff should be recorded unless I forget to start the stream like I did halfway through last lecture. I've got reminders now in my lecture plans, so I think we'll be okay. Um, all right, um, a quick note that Windows is the uh, staff development environment that we're going to be using most, okay? It's our primary environment, um, and so in general, our demonstrations will be in Visual Studio. Uh, however, if you are uh, in Xcode, that's not a problem. Xcode is a, a pretty nice IDE once you get into it. Um, but um, we got people shaking their heads. Oh, you got you got to give it a chance. Just use VS Code. Just use VS Code. Okay. Yep. You can use VS Code if you want. The auto grader requires you to use a bit of Xcode. Um, but uh, you will. We'll explain that in a bit. Um, but anyway, uh, just know that. Okay. Um, all right. Computational resources. Um, so when it comes to dealing with this course, um, you should know that you will have to uh, interact with Windows, OS X, and Linux as operating systems. Um, and that means at some point you'll have to have access to a Windows device, a Mac, and a Linux device. Okay, um, This is partly because the engines you're going to be writing are going to be multi-platform. You're going to have to write code that compiles, builds, and runs and completes all test cases and performantly on all three operating systems. So if you clear all the test cases on your development Windows device, congratulations, you just earned a 17 out of 50. Okay? And now you need to go get it building for the other uh, devices as well. That sounds terrifying. Typically, though, once you've got it working for one platform, it's just an hour or two of getting it to build and run on the next platform. And in many cases, you're going to clear all those test cases. You'll go from 17 points up to like 40, 45. You'll have some small edge cases you'll fix, and then you'll be good. Okay? Not super scary. Anyway, right? Um, when it comes to finding Windows devices, you can use the Kane Lab. It's a bit of a pain to get out here, I know. Uh, but uh, you can use any of the, the uh, Viz Studio machines as well. Um, if you <coughs> virtualize Windows um, or dual boot Windows, that's also a pretty good way. If you've got some cash, you can, of course, buy one. Don't recommend that. And, of course, if you've got a lot of great friends, you can use their device maybe in a pinch. However, um, that might not be a sustainable approach long term. For OS X, this is a bit of a tough one. The only Mac development machines I know of on campus that have Xcode uh, and that I've been able to get the engine building on are in Groundworks right across the hall, okay? So you want to consider those. The really expensive way to go is to just purchase a Mac. There are like Mac minis you can get used for a couple hundred bucks. Um, that might not be the end of the world, um, but hopefully you don't have to spend that. Um, and you can borrow a friend's Mac uh, if uh, you're really nice, maybe. For Linux, um, the Kane machines, uh, all these machines in here will support Linux. I think these have Linux. Most of the Kane machines do. Um, and I believe they all have all the dependencies you need as well, because I asked uh, for Kane to add them. I tested it a little while ago. You can generally, if you have a Windows machine or a Mac machine, you can add uh, Linux in uh, a virtual way, uh, parallels, or you can dual boot Linux, whatever you want to do. Um, there are Linux like boxes you can buy on Amazon, but I, it's a little bit spooky. I don't do that much. Maybe you can. And maybe your friend has a device you can borrow. Okay? Question. Does WSL work for Linux? What's that? Does WSL work for Linux? Oh, I remember trying that in the early days when I was designing the course and experimenting. And it was such a pain. It was a 
huge mess. I had to do all sorts of weird stuff and it was, it was not recommended. I don't re- recommend that approach. I got to work with 281. So oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. Yes. For the, for the Mac stuff, um, many of the iMacs on campus, the ones with blue like, back plates, do have XFit on them. Yeah. Most, not all of them, but most of them do. Okay. So, so if you just find one, they're all over the place. Got you. So there so are if Macs. It's not, not there, then well, you know, find it. Okay. Place, so there, there might be Macs with Xcode on. Uh, Central campus, but I don't. I can't verify those as well. Yes. I use WSL on Apple Okay. So I've I had a lot of audio issues with SDL. Okay, audio issues. Yeah. I just. Okay. Well, you can uh, do whatever you want to do uh, as long as it's working and it gives you uh, a reasonable development experience. It's all good. Um, we'll talk about how the autograder works soon on Monday, uh, as in soon, um, and. Um, uh, in general, uh, we'll talk about basically what the autograder does. Um, you simply need to figure out how to get it building on the autograder uh, and get it running. And then you try and approximate that environment on your own as best you can so you can develop authentically and have it work on the autograder. It's not going to be too hard. We've got a lot of good guides to help you with this, but just keep that in mind. So Groundworks, right? It is right across the hall. Uh, there's some really uh, nice uh, machines in there. Uh, and uh, yeah, they've got Unity, they've got Xcode, they've got Visual Studio. Um, it's not not bad stuff. Personally, what I do typically is I build it on my Windows desktop at home, and then when I need to test it, I actually uh, I finish all the test cases, and then I bring it in for one or two hours into the Groundworks, get it building there, uh, and then I'm done basically with the assignment. Okay, and that's uh, that's how it went for me. The high level schedule here. Um, I can't remember if I showed this to you or not, um, but if you recall, two weeks of exploration, we're nearly done with this, okay? We're going to have about nine or ten weeks of production. We'll have a week for exam uh, and reviewing for the exam, and then we'll have a couple weeks for research, uh, as in putting a custom feature into our engine. So I hope you'll start thinking about what interesting feature that could be, okay? Um, so that, that should hopefully be really fun for you. All right. Um, the course schedule, I think I already told you about this, uh, but when you look on Canvas, the first thing you do is you take your eyes to the left column, you find the day's date. Um, usually it will be highlighted in red if it is. You move your eyes right to where you can find the lecture or discussion notes. Um, and if you keep going right and you hit a green block, that means an assignment is launching that day. And you can like click, oh, sorry, in these two columns, they're readings, okay, not assignments. If you're over in these two columns, you hit a green thing, you can click on it, you can read the assignment spec. Awesome. You do the assignment. If you hit red, it's due that day at 4.30, the start of class. As in, if it's 4.30, it's late. So you need to have it in before 4.30. If you see a yellow block, that's what you're meant to be working on at that moment in time. Okay? Not a super complex schedule. Uh, some of my 494 and 498 students are used to way crazier schedules than this. With like three or four assignments going at one time. It's a good time, for sure. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, all right. Okay. Oh, by the way, sometime this semester, and I think it's going to be on uh, the 23rd, we're going to have uh, an extra credit assignment, a pretty big one, The Entire History of Video Games. It is a six-hour-long documentary. If you are there for the whole time, you're getting points, okay? It is a fantastic documentary. Uh, I'll talk about it more as it arrives. Okay. <coughs> yep. Okay, blah, 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 blah. There are some missing elements. If you just look at the schedule, um, you will see assignment specs, you'll see deadlines, all that good stuff. What you won't see uh, are uh, the rubrics themselves and the point distribution, okay? So you might want to look through the Canvas assignment tabs if you want to see how we're going to grade those assignments, all right? Quick note on grading and policies. There are 1,000 points in this course, official non-extra credit points, okay? Um, that makes it pretty easy to tell how valuable an assignment is. Exploration is uh, about uh, 100 points, 50 points a pop for these two weeks. Then we're going to enter engine production, <coughs> about 35% of your total grade, okay? The exam is going to be about 25% of your total grade. Uh, the engine research is going to be about 15, and our quizzes are going to be about 10, okay? Uh, the postmortem you do at the end is going to be about 5% of your grade, okay? And, uh, yeah, so... There you go. There's going to be several opportunities for extra credit. At the end of every assignment, you'll find this little give feedback button. Let me see here. Where is it? Here. 
assignment two, you'll find this little uh, give feedback button right here. If you provide feedback here, uh, you will get, I think, how much extra credit is it? I think it's like half a point or something. You'll get uh, one half point for every piece of feedback you give, uh, AKA for every assignment you get feedback on, you get half a point. Okay, I recommend you do it, it's super fast. And it's extremely valuable as we balance and tweak and fix and change things in the course, okay? Um, because this is the first time, like, we've, you're, you're the guinea pigs, uh, and uh, it's very important uh, for the future that we understand the experience you're going through. So uh, let us know how things are going, okay? Don't keep it to yourself. We really appreciate you letting us know if you're having a good time, if you're having a not-so-good time, uh, and in particular why and what you might be interested in changing, what you think could make the assignment more beneficial, okay? All right. So uh, let's keep going here. <clears throat> the target median grade uh, is a B, okay? Uh, that's not my choice. Uh, that is required of upper-level CS courses. Um, now, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, the course is probably going to be okay if we miss this by a bit. And if we miss this by a bit, I imagine hopefully we'll be miss it up by a bit. Uh, but especially considering that you're all taking this pre-alpha course, like I really want to be very kind to you in the grading department this semester. So I, I, I'm guessing the faculty uh, won't come after me too much if maybe it's a little bit higher than this. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, this is to say, do the best you can. All right, don't panic about your grade too much. If you're putting in a good effort, I'm going to make sure you come out of this okay. All right. Uh, no matter what, you are you are our guinea pigs. So we're going to take very good care of you, okay? Um, collaboration, okay? Uh, please check the assignment specs for any explicit rules or restrictions. The high-level peer discussion is allowed, uh, but never, ever directly copy code, okay? You can talk about general ideas for how you might want to approach things, right? And that's actually a really good debate to have, uh, very beneficial. In fact, our staff has been doing that to improve the assignments, do not copy each other's code. Okay, make sure you're writing each other. Uh, you're writing uh, your own code, and uh, you should be okay. Um, if you are getting examples from the internet um, or from GPT, um, please put in a little credits.txt in your repo uh, those links to basically what you took. Okay, so we know uh, what you wrote uh, and what you took, and what we shouldn't put in through the MOS checker. Okay. All right, participation. Uh, do you need to attend every lecture? The answer is no. You don't need to attend on time either. The lectures are recorded. The discussions are too. Things are typically due at the start of a uh, lecture. However, sometimes this is different. In particular, when like spring break comes up, we might put the deadline right before spring break starts so that you don't have to worry about it during the actual break itself. Okay. Um, the late penalties are a little bit different than my other courses. Um, if it's not auto-graded, it's the same as 494 and 498 uh, XR. It's 20%. If you are late but under four to 24 hours late, then it's 100% we won't grade it. The canvas closes and we, you won't be able to submit. If it's auto-graded, this is kind of interesting, um, you're going to have 20% off if you're late at all, but then uh, you can submit whenever. As long as you submit before the auto-grader off date, which is right after the exam, uh, you will, uh, yeah, you're, you'll be able to do that. The auto grader off date is right here. It's right after the exam. It's in early April, okay? So you can go back and try and scavenge points if you want to, um, and you can do that for quite a while. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, yep, this is your Python algorithm, at least for non auto graded assignments. The official timekeeper is Canvas slash the auto grader. In particular, it's not when you submit to the auto grader. It is when the auto grader finishes grading your stuff, Okay. So if you submit and then it takes an hour, 30 minutes or so maybe to actually get a grade, like that's your, that's your actual submission time as far as lateness goes, okay? So please be careful, all right? Submit early so you don't get log jammed right next to a deadline. If you see, let me see here. Um, if you see that one auto grader is really busy, has a huge stack, okay? And another auto grader doesn't, maybe everyone is developing for Windows this semester but no one is developing for OSX, slip into OSX and you've got lightning fast, like 30 second returns and feedback, okay? Uh, and that's what I recommend. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, more about that soon. Um, in terms of extensions, we do have the ability to give you extensions on Canvas assignments and auto reader assignments. 
Um, but in general, we don't do this often. It's only going to be granted in cases where things are truly outside of your control, okay? Uh, and in cases where even good habits wouldn't have saved you, all right? And so please be careful. Uh, please uh, submit, uh, you know, submit early, submit often. And when you submit something to Canvas, make sure you download and check what you submitted. Okay. Um, on auto grader assignments, this isn't a huge deal. In general, the auto grader will never take your score down. So when it comes to your final grade for any auto graded assignment, you're just going to get the highest score that you've ever gotten. Okay. So if you tank at the last second, I remember in like 281, um, at least when I was taking it uh, quite a while ago, like a decade ago, uh, it was, and I feel so old when I say that, um, it was like your most recent submit was your final grade. And so if you are trying to get a slightly better submit, but oops, you included a bug or a typo and it just crashes and you get zero, like that's your final grade, okay? That was pretty hardcore. Uh, I don't think it's still that way. I'm not sure what it still is, but um, what it is, but hey, let's talk about quizzes in the exam, okay? Um, this isn't something I'm super excited to include in the course, but as an upper level CS, we really do need to verify that all of you are individually getting this knowledge and that that's standardized uh, and it's um, not something you can, uh, uh, you know, um, skate by with a teammate helping you out. OK, we got bi biweekly quizzes. Um, you're going to want to bring a device. It's going to be 20 minutes. It's going to be 20 questions. So 60 seconds a question. Uh, and uh, the topics will tell you in lecture. These are not aimed at being particularly hard. And in general, I'm never trying to trick you in this course. Um, <clears throat> and the lowest score is going to be maximized. So we're kind of going to, air quotes, drop your worst score. Um, and uh, basically, pay attention in lecture, pay attention in discussion, maybe review them right before quiz quickly, skim them, uh, and you'll almost certainly be just fine. Okay? Um, the exam. Okay? Uh, the exam is probably going to happen. Uh, let me see here. We have... I think the day decided it's going to be in the evening and possibly late evening of Friday, uh, the 4th, sorry, uh, uh, the 5th of April. Um, and we want to give you as much time on this as possible. We're probably going to make it a very long exam time so that you have plenty of time to sit there and think if you want to. Um, <clears throat> and um, yes, that's going to occur toward the end of the semester. It's not a final. Um, it is going to cover a lot of the contents of the course um, and including homeworks, including challenges you face on the homeworks uh, and stuff like that. We'll talk more about the exam because we'll have an entire week dedicated just to that, uh, making sure that goes well for you. OK, um, and again, it's not going to be particularly hard. OK, I'm not trying to trick you or take your points at all. Um, and uh, it's mainly verification of your knowledge. Uh, and the true challenge, I think, the true difficulty of this course is going to come through those auto-graded assignments where you're building out a pretty legit engine, okay? It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of code, a lot of thinking. Yes? I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Like, if we submit on the auto-grader before the deadline, say we get, like, 40 out of 50, mm -hmm. and then later in the class we want to, like, try and get that up, is that possible, or would we still get the 20% off so we can get it? Yeah, the 20% off is going to cap you at 40 out of 50, Right, 80% will be your highest. So if you've already got that, it's not going to be super valuable for you unless you just want the challenge of going and getting those, right? Um, all right. Um, accommodations, if you've got accommodation uh, letter generated uh, by the uh, SSD office, then I've already seen it, uh, and you already have time and a half on quizzes. Now, the exam, we'll have to talk because the exam is already designed to give you a ton of time. You're probably almost certainly not going to need that, uh, and everyone's going to get it. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that as it comes up. We're going to have a backup exam date for sure. I'm not entirely sure when that's going to be, but we'll have to talk um, and we'll figure something out. Okay. All right. Uh, resources really quickly. Um, office hours. Please check Canvas. I was really excited. It was very hard to find uh, great talent for, um, for a course that hasn't been taught yet. But we got just tremendous talent, like an all-star team for sure uh, this semester. You're very, very fortunate. Um, and uh, we're going to have... Office hours Mondays, Wednesdays, right after class from me. Nick Hill has got a nice two-hour block on Thursday. You should start your assignments for sure, your homework for the week for sure by Thursday. If you haven't started then, uh, you might be toast, okay, uh, when we start uh, next week. Um, Ravi is going to be on Thursdays and Saturdays, and then I'm going to get you on Sundays uh, the day before the deadline, okay, 9 to 10. This is like special 
pre-alpha version of the course uh, that you get the Sunday office hours, okay? I was here on Sunday. None of you came. <laughs> brutal, brutal. And that tells me, I'm talking with Nikhil, we got to make this course harder because we need the office hours. Okay. Hey, good job. Good stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, same happens in 494. Um, we'll be seeing you in office hours soon, I'm, I'm sure. Um, chain of help, okay? In pretty much all my courses, you probably heard this before, the worst thing that can happen to you is you get blocked. Okay, you get blocked on some issue, some tiny little issue, uh, and you lose five hours where a little bit of advice could have saved you uh, all of that, right? Uh, so here's your chain of help. When you get stuck on something, it could be a frustrating Xcode issue, okay? It could be a more interesting seg fault or crash you've got going on. Um, or a circular dependency, you know, God help you, okay? Um, when you hit that issue, you're going to spend 15 minutes Googling and experimenting, okay? Then when that 15 minutes is up, you will, you will post on Piazza, okay? And then you'll start working on some different issue, okay? Um, and then if Piazza can't help you or isn't helping you fast enough, you bring it to the next office hour session uh, and we'll work with you and help you debug it, Okay? And you have to do it this way, all right? If you let yourself get wrecked for five hours straight, you're not going to have enough time, okay? Runtime efficiency is very important in this course, but dev time efficiency is probably more so, okay? Otherwise, it's going to be late nights, and that's never good. That snowballs, okay? All right, um, private correspondence. You can uh, use Piazza, private messages there. You can also DM me on Discord. That's a little bit weirder, though. Don't do that. Um, and you can send uh, me an email as well, aergrtumich.edu, if you want to. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of great communities on uh, this campus that will immerse you in game dev uh, and the joys of XR and all that good stuff. ARI meets once a week. Wolverine Soft meets once a week. Okay. Uh, IG Ann Arbor is coming up on uh, next Thursday. Did I have uh, the announcement uh, for that? Where is that? Uh, you put it in the IGBA server. What? All right, hold on. Do you get it? IGDA 2, IGDA 2, A2 for Ann Arbor. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see here. You've got uh, Stardoc coming up next Thursday. This is going to be a talk uh, by uh, Ray Ann Harden, uh, the lead uh, HR uh, and lead recruiter at Stardoc. Stardoc being Michigan's largest game studio. We're going to talk about them more today, actually. Uh, and um, yeah, it's going to be a great talk if you are interested in the industry. If you're interested in beefing up and improving your resume uh, and networking abilities and portfolio in general, um, Rayanne knows knows everything. Okay, uh, she is uh, she helped me create the guide on Canvas. So you gotta you gotta come to that. Uh, I think you get do you get extra credit for that? Hold on, <clears throat> we got too many extra credits here. You do get extra credit. You get two points. Oh, all right, you get two points. Uh, of extra credit, all right, for going to each one of those. You take a selfie with the speaker, upload it to Canvas, two points, just like that. Yeah, I just wanted to say, the Wolverine Soft Pass meeting is tomorrow um, at 7 p.m. at the DOW MPAC. So, all right. Like, yep. Mm -hmm. You also get points for Wolverine Soft attendance, um, which is like free money for all the Wolverine Soft officers, because, uh, you know, um, but uh, I encourage that as well. Being at these kind of events will help you. They'll immerse you. They'll help you make connections uh, and just make uh, this game dev existence uh, a much more fun and uh, wonderful one for you. Okay. Um, health. All right. Uh, your mental health, your physical health is paramount. You cannot effectively learn uh, if you are in a degraded state. We need to make sure you're getting enough sleep. Eight hours, please. Get all your meals. Don't skip any. I remember when I was in 281, 482. I skipped meals. It just snowballed. It was bad. Okay? Um, so please, if you are feeling like things are starting to snowball, the semester's getting away from you, nothing is working, you don't feel good mentally or physically, please reach out to your instructors, okay? We've seen this kind of thing before. We can give you tips. We can help you uh, become more efficient. Uh, we can give you perspective, okay, uh, which can, can put you at ease. Uh, and uh, just please let us know, and uh, and we'll we'll do our best to try and uh, help you out. Okay. Also, caps as well. I've heard that they're pretty great, uh, but they also can have some waiting times and stuff like that, which uh, is a bit of a bummer. Um, and the number one rule, uh, 
of literally all my courses uh, is uh, you got to communicate, okay? If you've got some discomforts that are happening or struggles or some problems that you're facing, we can help you with them if we know about them. So please reach out. Uh, very, very little time this semester for me, uh, but I'll make time for you, okay, uh, when you got these problems. Uh, even if it might take me a few hours or maybe a day to respond or so, I, I promise I'll do it, okay? Um, so uh, please, uh, yeah, uh, let us know if you have any questions uh, and uh, let us know how you're feeling throughout the course. This is the first semester of this course. Like this is the prime time uh, to, to observe and watch how things are going for you. We're going to do that, okay? So let us know. Have any questions? All right. Quick thing, this is my third lecture of the day on Mondays and Wednesdays. It's like my sixth hour of standing up and talking. My voice is a bit scratchy. I apologize. Uh, and if my lectures are a bit, uh, like, out there, or I don't know what you call it. My vocab starts to disappear. That's the first thing to go when I'm getting tired. Uh, so uh, I apologize for that. Um, that's how it's going to be. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what I want to talk to you about, we got about 40 minutes left. These aren't super long lectures compared to what you might be used to, those two-hour long capstones. Um, I want to talk a little bit about modern engines, and I want to talk a little bit more uh, about the engines that you've been using, okay? The philosophy behind them, why they work, why they are the way they are. Um, and then next week, we're going to start to get a little bit lower level, okay? We're going to start high level this uh, week and last week. Uh, we're going to get low level soon, okay? All right. <clears throat> okay. All right. I'm going to lift this curtain in just a moment, uh, and I want you to tell me what's behind it. Mario. Mario. Mamma mia. But which one? <laughs> Play up my Italian uh, heritage. Uh, yes. Which one? Three. Three. Bingo. Well done. <laughs> There we go. Super Mario Brothers 3. And compared to the first two Mario Brothers, the theming here, right, is impressive. You can get this feel that you really are at a theater, that Mario is an actor, that this is all part of a scene, a beautiful play, right, that is unfolding before you. And isn't it just really cute, right? Even when the action starts, you've still got the little curtains up here What's also cool, you might not have realized this, but when you go to finish a stage, you actually finish the stage by running off the stage, right, to the back area, uh, uh, you know, where you'd find uh, um, uh, stage props and stuff like that. And so what's really interesting to me uh, is that the team, right, I, I couldn't find the interview, I apologize, but the theater motif has been a thing for Nintendo for a very long time and was one of the kind of first big recurring motifs uh, you saw across uh, games and, and the companies that made them. So theater motifs would actually show up in a ton of Nintendo games, right? And still is, right? Uh, this is actually before Super Mario Bros. 3. This is Super Mario Bros. 2, uh, the USA version. Um, this is Paper Mario. Um, and we've got modern games upcoming that are entirely themed around theater as well. Theater and like theatrical performance is a big deal uh, in Nintendo's kind of world, all right? What was really interesting to me was that that idea for Super Mario Bros. 3, 3's uh, theater uh, kind of feel. Oh, and by the way, oh, sorry. This is actually the Game Boy Advance remake of Super Mario Bros. 2. I don't think they had this theater theming in the original one they made early. Um, Shigeru Miyamoto, creator of Mario, uh, and uh, Zelda, and a lot of great stuff at Nintendo. Um, in the early days, what they would do is they would work, obviously, extremely hard, very late hours, but they would take breaks as a team to go to the theater together, right? <clears throat> they would work in their uh, awesome offices here. This is a very retro interview. You're actually seeing inside of Nintendo. Good luck getting any footage like this these days, Okay. Uh, but they would work super hard and very long hours, and then they would all go to the theater uh, together and enjoy that as an experience. And that kind of gave them the idea that, wait a second, maybe, maybe Super Mario could be themed around a theater. Maybe the entire thing was a theater performance, right? Um, and when you think about it, right, when you look at a theater, a play, a performance, I want to ask you what you see. 
And I want to ask you if any of this sounds familiar. Because when I look up here, I see, well, a dynamic world. It's, it comes to life. It creates this uh, fake reality. It's even slightly interactive. But what I really see are actors, okay? And when I look around, I see props, which are kind of like actors that don't do anything, okay? And when I think about all this put together, I think, well, this is really a scene, right? It's a fake reality. It's a nice little packaged up scene. By the way, in theater, you can kind of swap these things out really fast. It's like they're kind of loading into the next scene, right? Um, sometimes that's called the intermission period instead of the loading screen. Um, and then, of course, if you want these actors to do anything, what do you have to give them? A script. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you might give uh, this uh, actor a dancing script, right? Uh, but this actor is also dancing, but maybe this actor sings uh, at this part. And so you give them the singing script as well. And when you look at this play, you have to imagine the Nintendo employees are sitting there and thinking, this feels so familiar, right? This feels so familiar because when they get home back to their office and they look at Mario, they think, that Mario guy, is he an actor putting on a grand performance for us? Because these look like actors, right? The Goomba, Mario, even the block could be considered an actor. It does certain things at the right time in the play, right? These could be props. And we call these levels, but you could really call them scenes, right? We're just really able to swap them in and out really fast, okay? Faster than humans could in a real life performance, all right? And of course, all these things need scripts to do their job. And so the theater motif, the theater analogy became one of the most consistent ways to talk about the various concepts within gaming, within game engines that you'll find, okay? By the way, the way that Nintendo looks at Mario is not as a plumber, okay? A plumber in a magical kingdom who goes and rescues a princess and eats lots of shrooms and is like super gold hungry too, greedy. Um, they don't look at him that way. You know what uh, Nintendo looks at Mario as? Nintendo looks at Mario and they see their A-list actor because Mario will do whatever job Nintendo needs him to do. Okay? They, they're not going to explain why Mario has a degree now or how he got it. Okay? Nintendo is famously very reluctant to add deep lore into series like Mario because Mario is just an actor. We hire Mario to be whatever we need him to be. Play tennis? Sure. Yeah, he can do that for this game, right? Hey, Mario, we really need you. Like, we've got a go-kart game coming up. Can you be our go-kart hero? It's like, mamma mia, that's a goal, right? And he says yes. And they've got an entire cast of characters who can fulfill all of these roles. Um, and so, you know, it's just a very interesting thing. It's just an actor performing roles from Nintendo's perspective, okay? Um, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so you look at all these different engines, right? Um, and if, if you're in the XR course, you've already seen this today, kind of. But you look at all these different engines, and you can see these concepts everywhere, right? When you look into the scene, you've got your scene view over here, right? You've got your actors, right? You've got them not just uh, in this area, but you've also got a list of them. You've got actors inside of a scene. That's what the level is called in Unity. And then they are performing scripts, okay? This analogy is something you're going to see in every single game engine that you come across uh, for the most part, okay? Now, I'd like to point something out to you that's very frustrating to me, okay? Is this cube called an actor in Unity? What is it called? It's called a game object, okay? But... Is this level called a scene in Unity? Yes. So Unity, why did you use part of the theater motif, but not all of it? Let's go and uh, look at Unreal Engine really quickly here, okay? What is this called right here in Unreal Engine official terminology? Uh, a level. No, this is a chair. What's oh, the chair? Sorry, I thought you were <laughs> no. uh, uh, an actor. 
It's called an actor. Oh, fantastic. Unreal. Good job. You got the part of the theater motif. Okay, well, hey, Unreal. Hey, Tim Sweeney. Tim Sweeney. Um, okay, what do you call the level? Call it a scene, right? What, what, what do they call it? Level. No, they call it a map. Yeah. They call it a map. Oh, what? No, you ruined it. Okay, and so what's really interesting is that the theater motif doesn't appear in pretty much any unified engine in any unified way. Bits and pieces of it keep appearing in different engines. In the engine you make, we are going to unify all these terms, okay? We'll slip in the term components in there a little bit. because yeah. Anyway, but we're pretty much going to unify this theater motif, so that's something to know, okay? When you think about game engine terminology, you will naturally, I think, uh, take the terminology from theater, which before games was probably the closest analog we have, okay? In fact, has anyone seen Wreck-It Ralph? No way. So Wreck-It Ralph actually uses this entire concept as its plot. All the video game characters are, in fact, actors that take, look at the player's input and try and do what the player wants, and then at the end of the day, the hero and the villain are like getting a beer and hanging out. Another good day job. Good job. Sorry I had to whack you uh, back there. Okay? It's just part of the job. Anyway, all right. So enough about this. The standard terminology in this course and ideally in the industry over time is going to be coming from theater. Okay? And this is, for the most part, the integrated engine experience. If you're using a deluxe engine like Unity or Unreal or Godot, uh, it's going to have these concepts. Um. But, you know, question, do we actually need these concepts? Are they required? Like actor, scene, script, etc. Like, do we need those abstractions, that model, to make our games? Well, the original Mario didn't have this because it was uh, like a so Yeah. You do not need these concepts to make a game. So welcome to the world of minimalist engines, which you all have experience with due to homework one, okay? Um, mono game, love 2D, pie game, okay? Um, and when it comes to these engines, you get none of this stuff, okay? You don't get actors or scenes. You don't even get scripts, okay? What does that even mean, all right? You don't get this nice fancy UI and these editing tools, importing assets and models. What do you get? What do you get? Anyone? Text editor. You get nothing. Okay. You get the text editor. You get a box of scraps. Impossible. Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave with a, with a box of scraps. Okay, that's it. Um, I love that clip a lot. Um, and there's. You know, there's something magical about that scene. It is amazing how Tony is able to take nothing and build something from it. It's a very honorable trait, right? Doing more with less. Um, and in that moment, you might feel one of the big reasons people use minimalist engines, right? Because they want to build up from scratch. They want to feel like they own and control everything. They want that feeling of accomplishment. So let's talk a bit about the box of scraps, okay? <clears throat> Typically... Right, you might not have scripts with luxurious life cycle functions like on update, on start, but typically these uh, minimalist engines will give you at least one entry point into a game loop, okay? And this tends to be called update or something up like that, or tick or something like that. Um, and from there, from that update, which the framework or the engine will call 60 times per second or 30 times per second, um, you can kind of branch out from there. You can create your own functions, your own update functions, which update all the actors or update all the enemy actors or whatever, okay? Or check collisions or whatever, okay? Um, tend, typically, these minimalist engines will also give you some sort of uh, rendering, basic rendering tech, okay? If you've got a basic image, well, let's provide you a function that just takes the image and takes a location to render it to. Some of these functions will be more advanced, they'll include more features, but some way to draw something is a key element. They'll get you started with that pretty quickly. They'll also typically give you some method to access the uh, input. 
So, hey, is the player pressing space? Is the player pressing right, up, left, down arrow keys? And a keys is a controller in use. Often they'll do these three things, and that's about it. Okay? Hey, I, I got a question. Um, what did you, uh, who used, uh, who used uh, Monogame? By the way, I heard Monogame was a big pain if you had a Mac. Sorry about that. I'm not sure how I'm going to fix it, though. Um, okay, so if you used Monogame, um, what did you think of the uh, Collider technology, the feature, the Collider feature in Monogame? Oh, you didn't? Oh, um, okay. Um, let's see. What else? Um, geez. What did, you, um, what did you think about the physics rigid body component in Monogame? You don't think anything because it doesn't exist. They didn't give you anything. All right. Uh, box of scraps. And it's not a very full box either, but the scraps are, are usable. They're useful. Okay. That's really pretty much all. All right. So what's the point you might ask? A minimalist engine, right? When you look at all this luxury here, because in Unity, there is built-in stuff. There's a nice physics system ready to go. It's just there for you. There's a collider system. There are an actor uh, abstraction. There are component slash script abstractions, a scene abstraction to help you organize everything. All of this is really wonderful, but it ain't free, okay? All these concepts might not be that useful to you. If you're making a small game or a very focused game, maybe you don't really care about the idea of actors. Maybe it doesn't matter to you. Maybe you don't need to be able to attach 10 different scripts to this one object, and you don't need easy reuse and you don't want a heavy-duty, nasty physics system, which is going to eat up all your CPU time, okay? Maybe you want to make a game that runs on a potato or something, okay? Um, and so this takes up mind space, right? It takes up storage. Um, it also steals a lot of the fun, a lot of the learning from you, okay? Also, by the way, um, if you don't like the way that Unity works under the hood, what can you do about it? can do nothing, okay? You can't do anything, all right? Unity, you got to take it or leave it. With a, min a minimalist engine, there are some exceptions to that, but there are complexities and constraints here that you might not want, okay? Minimalism has the advantages of simplicity and control, and then very underrated, okay? It can feel really good to be the underdog sometimes. Take a small engine and build that up from scratch. That's going to, it can feel really great, okay? All right. So one question uh, that's useful to answer here when it comes to engines in general is should you grab one off the shelf or should you make a custom engine? All right Now this course is all about making a custom engine. Uh, so hopefully there's some reason to do this in 2023. Otherwise we're in big trouble. Okay? Should probably just can the course. What do you think? I'm curious. Why? First of all, the easy one. Okay, why do you choose an off-the-shelf engine? What do you got? It's just way less work for you to do. You can focus on what you're doing. Yeah, right? Oh, you've got this great idea for this really artistic and unique game uh, about going for a simple jog through this really nice landscape, meeting interesting characters. It's a nice, sweet, uh, short story, okay? About a hike. And you just want to get that thing on the market as soon as possible before another idea jumps in your head or before someone scoops you with another cool game, short walk, okay? And you got to get this thing out. Well, or maybe you don't have a computer science degree, right? You can't make your own engine. You don't know how. It's going to be too painful. It's really good stuff. Free Engine, Unity, or Godot, right? Unity and Unreal have a really nice licensing scheme. They're not going to tax you until you're making big cash, right? It's good stuff. It's really good. In the first, the first thing I said to you this semester was we really are living in Nirvana in many ways as far as game engines, aren't we? You all looked at me like, what is this guy talking about? Well, this is what I'm talking about. This is pretty, it's a pretty good situation right now. We just have to make sure that it continues that way. What else we got? Why else might you want an off-the-shelf engine? It's kind of nice where there's a bug. Nine times out of ten, it's probably your fault. It's not something just like... Oh, yes. Really That's right. Hey, there's a bug in the engine. Unity uh, has a gigantic team working on making that a stable, nice engine. Um, and while they fail often, uh, probably not as often as you might, right? When you're making 
custom engine and a custom game on top of that custom engine, is it a bug in your gameplay logic or is it a bug in your underlying engine logic? I'll tell you, I hit that question just making the test cases in this course. Okay? And yeah, I got bit by that a few times. But you're not really, really dependent on like a third-party UI full what you do. So if, yeah. like, if they like have a new like, feature, a new one like you know, that, that has a bug, then your, then your old code may go wrong. You're talking about like why is a custom engine really great? Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right. But there are a couple more reasons why off the shelf is great too. Um, Jonah? Like a million other people that have been using it and are still using it and they can probably work. Yeah. Old Big time. And we talk about this in the XR space a lot. But in general, the more devs, the more people using something, the more polished, the more resources that thing tends to get. It's kind of like a path through the woods. Have you ever walked a path where you're like, I'm not sure I'm on the path. This thing's overgrown. There are trees and bushes in my way. And you're walking along this path and it's not very fun. There's tons of friction, but you're pretty sure there's treasure at the end, right? And then compare that to literally the like paved, you know, beautifully cut uh, walk through the park that you know, 10,000 people walk through every month. And it's just seamless and frictionless. But if there was ever treasure there, certainly someone's already grabbed it. Right? Yeah, that's what you're talking about, right? A bigger community is going to be really great, uh, and um, it's going to make things very pleasant for you. Bugs are going to get found by other people and not by you. It's good stuff, right? Yes? Uh, more obscure uh, features are more likely to be already implemented, stuff like uh, translations yeah. or platform or yeah. Yeah, bingo. General purpose, right? These engines are used by so many different people. They have so many different features, so many different teams say to Unity, Unity, I really need a PlayStation 5. I need an Xbox One export. Okay, I need a WebGL export. Okay, and then Unity can actually have the resources to go do that because everyone is contributing to that pot to keep that engine developing. Okay, the Sucker Punch engine, Sony first party studio, incredible engine. That thing ain't going to export for Xbox. Okay, it just ain't going to do that. Doesn't need to. No one's asked for it. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's right. Right. Way more community, better tutorials, better documentation, and uh, right. But okay, really quickly, what are some of the wins of a custom in-house? Oh, another big one that wasn't mentioned. If you're a business owner, recruiting. Okay. So I've got Yarger Engine. All right. It's the best engine out there. You got to believe me. Okay. It's going to change the world. The big problem though is I can't find anyone on Indeed who knows the Yarger engine. This is a big problem. Okay. Because that means I got to do all the work. What the heck? All right. If you have a popular engine off the shelf you're using, you can very easily recruit. There are lots of Unity devs out there, lots more being trained every day. Uh, and so that really makes the kind of talent liquidity pool very good for you. Okay, which is a really important thing. Lots of teams have been crushed by one person leaving at the wrong time. That couldn't be replaced. With Unity, that's much less risky. Okay, so let's go ahead. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about this a bit more. <clears throat> so, what, we got all these off-the-shelf engines. This is what I'm talking about. Some of these are proprietary. Some of these are open source, which is cool. Uh, but all of them are pretty easy to just grab right now tonight uh, and start working with. Okay. Okay. Does anyone know what creation is used for? Okay. Three hands. Okay, back. Yeah, uh, for Fallout and uh, Skyrim. And famously, the latest fantastic Bethesda product. Starfield. Starfield. Oh, heck yeah. Um, all right. What about uh, this one at least has a name. You can Google search. Does anyone know what this one is called? Really? Is that the Quake engine? No. No. <laughs> I, oh, I can see how you think that. Though. Yeah. Anyone know? No one knows what this one's called? Has anyone played a game called um, Death Stranding? Oh. Anyone played a series called Horizon? Zero Dawn, Forbidden West, all that? What's it called? Decima. It's called the Decima Engine. It's a very beautiful engine. Sony has actually been kind of muttering and talking about, like, can we make Decima like a Unity or an Unreal rival? Um, and I'm not sure... Um, but this is an internal engine, right? That is 
not, it's talked about somewhat, usually at conferences, but we're fairly lucky they even have logos, okay? A lot of internal engines don't have much of a name, uh, and they certainly don't have logos, okay, or media, because they're just for internal use, really. Um, okay, this one may be a slightly easier. Not too much easier, though. Is it Frostbite? It is Frostbite. Well done. Good stuff. And who makes Frostbite? Is it EA? It is EA, and which team? Um, I think it's a I think MTS game. It's called Dice. The team's called Dice, uh, Digital Illusions. Uh, and um, they use it on the Battlefield series and basically anything that Dice makes. Um, they were also thinking about using it on the Sims franchise when I was there. It's just like, that makes no sense at all. <laughs> um, they uh, famously, we're going to talk about that engine a little bit because this thing has been some, this is a troublemaker, okay? Um, so EA famously had a, something of a mandate for a few years where Andrew Wilson basically said, team, we need to start getting this engine to be more of an in-house uh, thing where everyone's using it, everyone's dog fooding it. It'll improve the quality. It'll improve the documentation. If it gets really good, we might be able to turn it into a Unity. Okay? And so what happened was this engine that had been made purely pretty much for uh, first-person shooter games with high amounts of destructibility and had pretty much only been used by the team in Sweden, um, at DICE was now being used by the RPG team uh, working on Dragon Age, uh, was it two? No, Dragon Age Inquisition. Okay, well, unfortunately, this engine made for first person military modern shooter games didn't have things like inventory systems programmed in. It didn't have interesting, you know, useful save functionality, and it was just lacking a ton of features. What was even more painful was that like, the team on uh, Dragon Age, what, Bioware, I think, in Canada, uh, did not have super good knowledge of how this engine worked, so they couldn't really easily add the features themselves. Um, what's more, the team that did know how it worked and could support them, the team in Sweden at DICE, they were too small. They were supporting other games trying to use the engine. And so when Bioware requests an inventory system from the you know DICE uh, in Sweden... They're like, okay, maybe we can get to it in a few months. Like, I, it's brutal. Okay, that's those are problems that would fix themselves over time. But EA kind of gave up, and now games like Titanfall and Jedi Survivor. I think they're using no Jedi Survivor is using Unreal. I think Titanfall pretty famously used Source. I think uh, same uh, thing as the Half Life Two Portal engine. So anyway, okay, big tangent uh, finished. Right, these are in-house engines, and there aren't as many up here because it's kind of hard to find ones that have cool logos. Okay, because they are hidden. They're not public. They're not open for use. But if you go to one of these companies, you might end up using them. So some examples real quick, all the off-the-shelf ones we talked about, right, in-house ones we talked about. When you think about the companies that use these, right, you've got actually some big companies, some smaller companies uh, that use both of these. Square Enix, right? makes heavy use of Unreal. Famously, they ditched their crystal tools and kind of stopped a lot of internal engine development um, to switch to Unreal because, yeah, engines caused a huge problem for Square Enix. We're going to talk about that. Crystal tools wiped out, like, Final Fantasy XIII, basically. Um, MiHoYo famously uses uh, Unity off the shelf for their uh, Genshin Impact, Honkai Star Rail, uh, and uh, that works well for them. Stardock? Right? Michigan's largest game studio uses Unity for some of their products. Okay, Really easy to recruit for that engine. Um, and pretty much all indie studios ever use Unity. That's not true, but a lot of them use Unity uh, and off-the-shelf stuff like Godot or Unreal. Okay, <clears throat> Now, there are a lot of in-house engines that are really interesting. Okay, When you look up here, you find some names that are pretty special names, pretty prestigious. Okay? Naughty Dog, anyone know them? By the way, what is Naughty Dog's job? Bingo. You scooped me. You got it right. Okay. <laughs> Naughty Dog's job is not to sell copies of their games. That's not their job. Naughty Dog's job is to sell you a PlayStation console. Okay? Because the only place you're playing Last of Us 
or Last of Us 2, or Uncharted, or back in the day Crash Bandicoot, that was my game, is on a Sony PlayStation. Okay? So you're going to buy that PlayStation. You're going to do it. Naughty Dog makes some of the most beautiful, breathtaking games on the planet. They're incredibly impressive, and they run on cheap, crappy PlayStation hardware. Commodity hardware. How expensive is a PlayStation uh, 5 right now? What's that, like 300, 400 bucks? 500? Okay, you can, you can get a crappy GPU for 500 bucks, okay? And suddenly, like, so how is the PlayStation 5 uh, meant to have not only a decent GPU, but also a good processor, but also, um, you know, operating system software, hardware, right? The PlayStation and basically all consoles are very cheap hardware for the most part, right? The Nintendo Switch is, is um, literally like... This thing dunks all over it, okay? <laughs> um, the Nintendo Switch, and I got an image in here, I think, for you. The Nintendo Switch uh, is mobile hardware from, like, 2017, okay? Um, and not Apple, like, crazy ARM chip mobile hardware either. Um, anyway, okay, we're going to talk about why a lot of these teams still use in-house engines in just a little bit, Okay. When you think about the expense of in-house versus off-the-shelf, when you look at off-the-shelf, the cost is pretty low. Now, I know you have to give royalties to Unity. You have to give royalties to Epic. Maybe you got to pay for a $15 a month subscription from Unity. Okay, Compare that to keeping a team of 50 extremely talented, best-in-class engineers on your roll for years to make your own custom engine. Okay, and this expense literally goes to zero. Okay, so it's you can't even see it; it's so small in comparison. Right? You compare that to in-house. Yes, you're kind of getting away from licensing costs because you're using your own engine, but um, you have to have a really expensive, very talented team uh, to make that work over the long term. It better be worth it. Okay, that's a that's a huge loss for in-house. All right, let's talk about recruiting. It's extremely easy, very nice, off the shelf. Tons of people know Unity. Um, <clears throat> it's amazing. It's like your competitive, competing studios on the other side of the world are training your future employees potentially because you suddenly have this talent liquidity where people can swap all over the place. It's really, really great. Um, In-house, really hard, okay? Um, in many cases, the, like the best you can do is you can say, hey, these students at the University of Michigan have made their own engines. They're kind of cool. Maybe they would know how to come up to speed on our secret internal engine if we give them a few months. And that sounds really expensive and really crappy situation, right? And that's the best you're going to do. Unless, I don't know, maybe, I've, I've talked to the MSU faculty a lot. I'm pretty sure they don't have any secret like tech sharing plans going on over there. In fact, they, they want this course over there right now, I'm pretty sure. Um, and, you know, who knows? Uh, but anyway, recruiting is a big deal. Uh, community, okay? It's going to be pretty good if you've got an open source, popular, off-the-shelf engine you're grabbing, okay? Lots of people know it. Lots of people are creating tutorials for it. They're literally doing your job for you, okay? Uh, creating great documentation. Um, In-house, it's like, whoa. And in some of the interviews... The postmortems for games like Dragon Age, it was like we've got these amazing, um, you know, these amazing engineers in uh, Edmonton, Canada, and they can build engines. They can add things to engines. They can customize them, but they don't have the documentation. The documentation is crap, right? Uh, and so they're moving slowly. And it's really hard to add things and retrofit things on, and it's just hard. It's brutal. Okay. All right, I want to point something out. Like, we got a huge losing streak here, okay? This is looking like it's over before it's even started, all right? They're in-house, uh, sorry, off-the-shelf engines just running away with the whole thing, okay? All right, in-house team. Like, we're going to need a miracle, all right? We're going to need a miracle. Can someone deliver us a miracle? What's the miracle going to be? There's some things that you can't do with general purpose, optimized for all, off-the-shelf engines. That's exactly right. Let's talk about customizability, okay? So when it comes to off-the-shelf engines, Unity, right, Unreal, like there's customization you can do, 
these engines do try and give you some ways to kind of extend the engine. If you're um, a very big, important client, sometimes you can get the source code to those engines, okay? But as you're going to discover in this course, and I think something of a theme in this course, is that expressiveness and flexibility is often, there's a lot of tension there against performance, okay? Often, if you want to make something that's general purpose, it's going to work in every case. That really makes it kind of hard to keep that as performant uh, compared to if you just said, you know what, we're going to place limits on what this engine can do, and that just allows us to fly and have a really nice, fast implementation that's also somewhat you know, simple and straightforward uh, in certain areas. For instance, collisions. Um, with in-house engines, the ultimate magic of in-house engines is that you have a lot of power, a lot of flexibility, okay? Um, and let me give you an example here, all right? Control can sometimes be literally everything, all right? Has anyone played Ghost of Tsushima? Okay, when I see screenshots and GIFs like this, it's like magic, okay? Not only is it artistically incredible, but technically, like these particles look absolutely nuts, okay? You've got this just gorgeous fog back here that's moving and dissolving and reforming. You've got these kind of flower particles uh, with their nice movement. You've got this really lush, detailed grass, right? The clouds in the background, everything looks immaculate, incredible, full bursting of life, right? Uh, just completely beautiful. And this is somehow, this looks like a crazy, like RTX 3, uh, you know, um, 5000 thing to me. Uh, and uh, something you'd expect from a desktop PC game. Um, but this runs and at a somewhat stable frame rate on a really crappy piece of hardware on a PlayStation 5, okay? PlayStation 4. And that's complete magic, right? It's absolutely incredible. Um, and it took, I think it took Sucker Punch about five years to make this game. And Sucker Punch is one of those few teams that has an in-house studio that can be dedicated to this kind of stuff. And they do it, okay? Just like Naughty Dog, Sucker Punch is given one job, okay, from the Sony higher-ups. What is that job again? It's not to sell copies. It's to sell consoles. Get people to buy a PlayStation and then Sony's going to recoup their costs through licensing fees, through third parties selling their games, okay? But we have to get them in. We have to get them into that ecosystem, okay? And so if you try and recreate this kind of thing in Unity, I'm guessing you're going to have a very, very bad time, uh, in particular on console, okay? You might be able to approach this on desktop with a nice, really, really, really nice rig, expensive rig. But um, I'll tell you from experience... I've got this crappy looking kind of low poly, right, horror game called Greek Tragedy. It's kind of a PS1 era, like Resident Evil style game. Get the crappy graphics on purpose, okay? You should know that. <laughs> Damn it. Um, and look at this. The first time I put this lo fi game, not a ton going on, onto the Nintendo Switch, 13 frames per second. Okay, 13 frames per second. Could barely believe my eyes, okay? Now, Unity isn't known for being that performant in, in most cases anyway. It is very general purpose. It's a very nice uh, development environment. Um, but performance ain't its, ain't its real focus, okay? Anyway, right? Sucker Punch spends a lot of resources to maintain a team so they can have the best particles on console bar none, okay? And that's what they do. And it makes sense for them. And it's worth it, Okay. Anyway, control is sometimes paramount. We've only got a few minutes left. I'm going to talk to you briefly about Stardock. This is uh, Michigan's largest game studio. They're famous for their large kind of simulated game experiences like Gal Civ or like games like Siege of Centauri, which will send tens of thousands of units toward your tower and you have to defeat them. Okay? Tons of units. Very cool stuff. Um, and for that, you know, they have their own in-house engine. It's highly parallel. It's very good at uh, processing and simulating and rendering tons of units at a time, okay? But Stardock also makes the political machine, which is kind of a board game style uh, political sim that comes up every four years when the elections appear, right? Um, and this is not a game that is relying on great computational uh, and, you know, graphics performance, it's just not, okay? It makes sense then that Stardock is a multi-engine company 
because they use their own internal engine, which is super fast, really hard to recruit for this, right? But it does that big scale simulation game that Starlock is famous for. But when they want to make their other games, they're not quite as famous for, what do they use? They use the off the shelf Unity. It's the right tool for the right challenge, okay? And so we're seeing a lot of that these days uh, as well, even among the big teams, okay? Uh, even, I remember, even at EA, I walked in, uh, Peter, well, okay, I should probably not NDA, NDA. Um, okay, I walked into some rooms at EA, and I saw that we were doing prototypes on Unity and not our in-house engine. You know why? Because Unity is super fast. You can prototype in it quickly, cheaply, get your design figured out, and then once the design, the game design is fantastic and working, you can move it over to the in-house engine to get the beautiful aesthetics, great performance, all that stuff, Okay. So universal engine traits. We're going to go through this really quickly. Iteration is key. All engines will try and help you get into the game fast, play it fast. Okay, these buttons at the top will get you going. They'll use a scripting language because compiling C++ can take a long time. Okay, on The Sims 4, a very, very big code base, it took us about 45 minutes to compile any change to C++. So you better be sure that change is right. Okay, however, if we made a change in the scripting language, which was Python on top of our C++ core, then we could see it in a second, okay, or less, all right, and test it. It was great for iteration time, okay. Um, scripting, right? <clears throat> they can be textual scripting languages. They can be bespoke ones. Uh, they can also be standardized ones. In Unity, C Sharp is the scripting language, and that runs on top of a C++ multi-threaded core, okay. Um, you can also have really weird, visual, fun scripting languages. For instance, MIT Scratch, okay, where you've got this nice drag-and-drop block visual programming scripting language. Okay, it's really great. All right. By the way, what do you think these scripts do? I'm just going to tell you, they simply move the things right. Okay. Anyway, um, in general, with engines, they want to promote reuse. So you'll create a script, you'll create a component, and then you'll attach that one component to many different objects. Different characters like this tower or like this unit, right, they're different. This one can shoot and can't move. This one can move but can't shoot. They still share a lot of components like having a team, having a key data store, okay, a key value data store, having the ability to see out in the world, right, and being able to be clicked on and selectable. And then they have their own bespoke components to differentiate them, okay? No industry is safe from game engines, okay? From advertising to defense to research, you can use game engines to shill your product, okay? You can use game engines for training and simulation. You can use it for research, right? Computer vision testing uh, and all that good stuff, okay? No industry is safe if you open up Unreal Engine. Who did Unreal Engine for their one, their uh, homework one? Okay, uh, I think only a couple people did. When you open up Unreal Engine, you'll see games, of course, but the starter projects also involve video and film, architecture, automotive. It's exciting stuff. If we need the line to keep going up, then we're going to have to consume and eat every industry we can. And uh, the game engines are doing a very good job of that right now. Uh, and so the stonks uh, are looking good, okay? Uh, and they need some serious returns. All right, the summary here, okay? Common engine model is from theater. That's what we're going to use in this course. Remember that. you got three types of engines. you got beginner, drag and drop, minimalist, and integrated, industrial grade. Okay. Off the shelf versus in-house, the former absolutely dominates. These days, the answer, if you want to make a game, is realistically, you know, just grab Unity or Godot or Unreal off the shelf. Okay. However, in certain circumstances, the only way you're going to get it done is via an in-house engine. And so it's really useful that we learn this stuff also, you need to be the ones to make the next best uh, off-the-shelf engine, okay? Uh, or to fix up the ones that are out there that aren't all that great. Um, so uh, this course still has value uh, even if uh, in-house is in trouble, okay? <clears throat> so um, universal engine traits, things like quick iteration, right? Scripting is a big part of that. Um, UIs that allow you to quickly get into the game uh, are very much part of that um, and uh, all that stuff. And they're eating more industries by the day, Okay. Um, and I think next week it's time to get into the lower levels of things uh, and talk about building our own engines. Okay, finally, we're going to start going away from this high level stuff. If it's boring you, uh, you'll be in a better place soon. Okay, so be excited for that. All right, everyone, I think that's all I've got for you. I'm going to be around for the next two hours in this room. If you want to knock out this homework too, and I'm not kidding, this is a harder assignment. No joke, this is a harder week. Don't underestimate it, okay?
Um, all right. Good luck, everyone. Have an awesome weekend. We'll see you later. <clears throat> all right. Take care, everyone, on the stream. Bye-bye. Oh,